Hello and uh, welcome to today's uh, science sharing series with the National Weather Service Central Region. And I am happy to introduce today to everyone Dr. Samuel Steckman from the University of Wisconsin at Madison. And he will be giving a presentation on a model of the Madden-Julian oscillation skeleton. Uh, he is with the Department of Mathematics and Department of Atmospheric and Oceanic Services. So um, without further ado, I'll pass it on to uh, Dr. Steckman. Sam, take it away. Great. Thanks, John. Thanks a lot for the, the invitation. I'm happy to, to share this work with you, and I'm um, looking forward to getting some feedback from all of you. Um, uh, and I should maybe mention up front, I guess I'll, I'll, you'll see along the way who this is work with. This is work with uh, Andy Maida from New York University um, and a couple of others. Um, so I, I thought I'd begin with just a, a little overview of what the Madden-Julian oscillation is. Um, so what we see on this slide is uh, uh, a composite life cycle of the MJO as it moves, moves through eight phases, one cycle. Um, and this is showing composite cloudiness over the tropical belt from 20 south to 20 north. Um, and it's the, the dark shading, which is showing the enhanced cloudiness. And you can see that uh, um, and we are in the, the sort of Indian Ocean, Western Pacific region of the tropics. And we see uh, the enhanced cloudiness propagates slowly eastward at about 5 meters per second. Um, and I guess what you can notice from this slide is just how huge this thing is. This, this has a wavelength of about 20,000 kilometers or so in, on that order of magnitude, about half the circumference of the Earth. Um, one oscillation of the MJO takes about a month or two. Um, and it has a really slow propagation speed of about 5 meters per second, much slower than, than a lot of the gravity wave propagation speeds. Um, uh, one th so this is a, a nice slide because it just shows sort of the basic features of what the MJO looks like. Um, but one thing it hides is actually the multi-scale structure of the MJO because this is a statistical composite. Um, so if you actually look at um, um, individual time series in the tropics, so um, you'll see something like this on the left. So this is uh, um, this is the precipitation over a tropical belt, it, um, um, probably five south to five north, or maybe ten south to ten north, um, all the way around the globe, and for one year. Um, and you can see, sort of over this this area right here is is going to be Africa and South America over here. And then in the center is where most of the action is, this, the Western Pacific sector. Um, and here you can see um, these thin white lines, which you can sort of see, are MJO events propagating eastward at about 5 meters per second. And then there's a phase of suppressed convection followed by another MJO event. Um, so you can see that there are lots of small-scale structures within each of these Man-Julian oscillations. And so in a sense, the Man-Julian oscillation, it's an envelope of some smaller scale convection and waves. Um, and another thing I just wanted to point out at the moment is that there's, there's plenty of periods of time, like up here from March, April, May, and June, where there's not really any MJO signal at all. So the MJO, it comes, it goes. Sometimes it's strong, sometimes it's weak. Um, um, but the main thing I wanted to point out on the slide is, is the multi-scale structure. And another way to look at what this multi-scale structure is and the, what the smaller scale fluctuations are would be to, to look at the spectral power. So this, we get this from taking the Fourier transform of both space and time. Um, and after removing a background spectrum, which looks sort of like red noise, you arrive at a picture like this. Um, so the, the, we have zonal wave number down here and frequency on this axis. So the, low, the lowest frequency is the MJO down here with time scales greater than 30 days. Um, and then the, the higher frequency, shorter time scale um, phenomena are up here. So this is, these are convectively coupled Kelvin waves um, along this really enhanced blob and westward inertia gravity waves up here. And these are equatorial Rossby waves down in this sector. And so you can see that the MJO is, is the, the low frequency piece of what's going on here, and then there are higher frequency waves 
associated with um, so these are these this Kelvin and westward inertia gravity waves. These are um, the linear waves of the linear equatorial shallow water equations. Um, let's see, and I guess one more point I wanted to make on this slide is that um, um, the MJO, if if you could assign a dispersion relation to it, um, you would you would perhaps say that it has roughly a constant frequency of about 30, 40, 50 days. Um, you don't see a huge variation in frequency like you'd see with the Kelvin wave here. The MJO looks more or less like it has a constant frequency, which is a pretty peculiar dispersion relation. Um, OK, so that's a little bit about the multi-scale structure. Um, and then another important point is current comprehensive models, general circulation models. How well do they simulate the MJO? So th this plot on the left is, uh, is the, the same plot from the previous slide. And on the right, this is similar data from the GFDL general circulation model. And what you see is that it just doesn't have the spectral peaks associated with the convectively coupled waves, or really even the MJO either. Um, and this paper by Lin et al. from 2006, I guess it's, it's becoming a little dated now at this point, but um, similar results still apply. Um, and they look at actually 14 different GCMs, and um, the characteristics of each one, they differ. But I guess the, overall, the main message is that GCMs typically, they don't adequately represent these tropical phenomena of convectively coupled equatorial waves and the MJL. They certainly do well with other aspects of the climate, but when it comes to these tropical phenomena, they, they just don't adequately capture them. Um, so this makes you wonder, you know, what are the physical mechanisms of the MJO? Um, and so I'm going to present in this talk uh, a model for the MJO, which, which can hopefully, hopefully shed some light on that. Um, so this will be the outline of the rest of the talk. So I'll first go over some more features of the observed MJO, just to, to help paint a picture of what we're targeting um, for our model. Um, and after that, I'll get into the model and a few different versions of it, both a, a linearized version, a nonlinear version, and also a new stochastic version. Um, and then finally, I'll describe what we mean when we say the MJO is muscle, which is uh, the counterpart to its skeleton. Um, OK, so first I wanted to, to point out the, the circulation structure of the MJO. Um, so here we're looking at uh, uh, well, I guess it's a little wider than a tropical belt. We're going from 45 south to 45 north. And this is a composite picture. Um, we have the, the sh dark shading here shows the enhanced convection. And then what we see is a quadrupole vortex structure. So we see two vortices out here in front of the convection. And then to the rear of the convection is another set of two vortices. OK. And another feature of the MJO is that's very important is, is water vapor or, or moisture. Um, and what we see here is this is yet another statistical composite. So time is, is going up in this picture. And we're, we're going across um, around the circumference of the Earth here. And so what we see over this Western Pacific sector is um, the, the contours are the lower tropospheric moisture. So we see lower tropospheric moisture contours propagating eastward. And then after the moisture comes the enhanced convection, which is the dark shading right here. So before the enhanced convection of the MJO appears, there is first a moistening of the lower troposphere. This is going to be a, a key point that will come up when we design our MJO model later on. Um, OK, and there's some more. Um, motivation here, um, you know, why is the MJO so important? It has, it has a, a global impact on lots of different climate processes, um, some tropical processes like El Nino and monsoons and, and tropical cyclones. But also, it can have an effect on, uh, on mid-latitude predictability and, and some mid-latitude um, uh, storm events. So, and this comes from some teleconnections between the tropics and the extratropics, where the MJO can uh, can interact with uh, with barotropic Rossby waves um, um, uh, and have an impact in the mid latitudes as well. Okay, and there have been many previous theories that have been 
proposed for the MJL. Um, most of them have involved some sort of an instability mechanism. And I just want to bring that up because that's going to be um, in opposition to the model that I'm going to propose, which will not have an instability in it. So previous models tended to say they were looking for some sort of an instability that would lead to the Madden-Julian oscillation. And all sorts of different mechanisms were proposed for different types of instabilities. Um, and some of these models, they would they would capture one aspect of the MJO, but not another. So in the end, all of these previous theories, they're, they're at odds with the observations in various crucial ways, different ways every time. Um, and I guess the key point is that none of them can reproduce all of the MJO's fundamental features simultaneously. They might capture um, the, the circulation structure, but they might not get the propagation speed correctly or something like that. Um, so as of yet, there's, there's no theory for the MJO that has really been generally accepted. And the MJO was originally discovered back in 1971. So it's been around for quite a while. Lots of different theories have been proposed. Um, and what I'm going to present now is a new model for the MJO. Um, and this is, uh, this is from two papers with Andy Mina from NYU. Um, the first one in Proceedings of the National Academy, and the second one in Journal of the Atmospheric Sciences. Um, and what this model can do is it can simultaneously capture all three of the fundamental features of the MJO skeleton. Um, so it'll have the slow eastward propagation speed of 5 meters per second, this peculiar dispersion relation where the, the frequency is roughly a constant. And it'll have the horizontal quadrupole vortex structure. Um, and so the fundamental mechanism in this model is that it, it's a, it's a nonlinear oscillation. Um, and these oscillation, this oscillation is a neutrally stable oscillation between lower tropospheric moisture, which we'll call Q, and convective activity, which we'll call A. Um, and this is a model for planetary scale phenomena only. And that's, I guess I hadn't quite, hadn't pointed that out yet. But when we talk about the MJO skeleton, we mean its features on planetary scales. So if I go back to some of these earlier pictures, it is the features on these, these broad planetary scales not any of these individual small-scale features within each MJO event. So by the skeleton, we mean it's planetary-scale features, um, not any of the details within the envelope. Um, and so, so the model is going to be based on multi-scale concepts in the sense that um, um, we're going to represent the convective activity only by this dashed line the planetary envelope of the convective activity. And then, obviously, within that envelope, there are smaller scale synoptic and mesoscale features, um, which we won't actually represent the details of them. Um, so involved here, then, is, is there's this tacit assumption that, uh, um, so I said this is a neutrally stable oscillation. So there are obviously instabilities going on in the tropics, but our tacit assumption is that those instabilities are primarily on the synoptic and meso scales. Uh, and that the MJO is a neutrally stable phenomena on planetary scales. OK, so with this type of a conceptual setup, I guess the next question is, how can we model this planetary envelope of the convective activity? OK. And to help guide us there, we're going to look to observations. And um, I showed one picture of this already, but these are two more um, observational analyses that are showing the relationship between the lower tropospheric moisture and the convective activity. And what, what both of these plots show, and now um, earlier times are to the left. So we see here we're looking at uh, lower tropospheric moisture reaching its maximum. And then after that is is the, the let's see, this is, this is OLR, or no, it's black body temperature, I think, um, reaches its minimum. So the first, the lower troposphere moistens, and then following that, there's the maximum 
in convection or the minimum in, in OLR. And this plot is showing the exact same thing. So the, the solid curve here, which reaches its maximum first, this is the lower tropospheric moisture at 850 millibar. And then afterwards, it's the circles that come, the maximum precip. So we've now seen a few instances of this. Um, and so what we're basically seeing is that if you look on planetary and interseasonal scales, you find that the moisture leads to the convective activity. So then in terms of modeling, what this says is that maybe counterintuitively, you don't mainly have convective activity is a function of lower tropospheric moisture. It's, it's not directly tied to it. But instead, what this is suggesting is that the time tendency of the convective activity is proportional to the moisture. So if you just look at this equation, you can see that if, um, and we're allowing Q to be either positive or negative, so it's an anomaly. If it's positive, then what will happen is the convective activity is going to grow. Um, and if Q is negative, then the convective activity is going to decay. And so this is a, just a simple equation that embodies this idea that the lower tropospheric moisture should lead the convective activity. Um, and gamma here is just a, a constant. Um, it's a model parameter um, that we'll have to specify. OK. So in the end, the, the model ends up being pretty simple. It's, it's a, a nonlinear oscillator model, and we're going to put it together as a combination of this parameterization of convective activity along with linearized primitive equations. Um, and I should just point out how one, one small difference to, to the traditional primitive equations is there's no DVDT term here. And this is due to equatorial long wave scaling. So we're only concerned about the planetary scales. And so if you do a scale analysis, you'll find that this term drops out, the DVDT term, and you're left with geostrophic balance in the meridional direction. Um, uh, and I should also point out we're using our Coriolis term is using an equatorial beta plane approximation. Um, and as you can see, I guess there's no beta here, so these are these equations have been non-dimensionalized using some standard um, equatorial length scales. Um, okay, so the model is pretty simple. It's it's linearized primitive equations coupled to this convective parameterization, and the the way that the two interact is well. Here's how the the moisture affects the convective activity, and then the convective activity appears here. Um, we assume that, that the heating in our temperature equation is proportional to the convective activity, and then there is also a drying term proportional to the convective activity as well. Um, and then we have source terms here, uh, which represent radiative cooling and some sort of a, a moistening term. Um, and I guess it's these might look a little unfamiliar, but we've since we've non-dimensionalized, but there would usually be your buoyancy frequency n squared right here. Um, and this Q tilde is is um, a constant parameter, and it's the the vertical gradient of the the lower tropospheric moisture. Um, so in the end, the form of the model isn't very complicated. The the, the key new addition is really this this parameterization for convective activity. Um, where, where Q, the, the moisture, it causes a tendency to enhance the convective activity. It's a dynamic equation. Um, and I should also point out that there's, there's really a minimal number of parameters in this model. We introduced this new parameter, gamma. And other than that, there's, there's the vertical gradient of moisture and also a radiative cooling up here. So a minimal number of parameters to introduce. Um, and we're going to simplify further, um, but I'm not going to go through the details of this at the moment. Um, so at the moment, I wrote this down as a three-dimensional model. Um, we're going to use vertical and meridional truncations to simplify things. So in the vertical, we're going to assume a first periclinic mode structure like this. Um, so the, the, the wind is going to be equal and opposite in the upper and lower troposphere. 
Um, and in the meridional direction, we're only going to keep a few meridional basis functions. And they'll look like Gaussians or um, some similar types of profiles. Um, I won't go through the details of that right now, because um, I'm going to get in and show the mo what the model results look like. But we'll come back to that later. Um, so, so our model is, is essentially just those two pieces, a new convective parameterization along with linearized primitive equations. OK. So first, let's take a look at if we suppose we linearize the model. And I guess maybe I should point, go back and point this out. So there's really only one nonlinearity in the model, and it's in this convective parameterization. So if we linearize that just as a first step to see what the linear waves look like, we get something like this. So first, this is showing the phase speed and the oscillation frequency. So phase speed on the top plot, frequency down here. Um, and uh, on the x-axis here is the, the wave number with the um, positive wave numbers are showing eastward propagating waves, and negative wave numbers are representing westward propagating waves, even though it says a, the phase speed is positive. Um, so the MJO is an eastward propagating wave, and so it is represented by, by these modes right here. The, the red dots are showing just some standard parameter values. And what we see is that um, the phase speeds are roughly 5 meter per second, which agrees with the MJO. Um, and when we vary these parameters, you know, we want to know, is our model robust to these parameter changes? And we're changing, making big changes. Like, we change gamma by like a factor of 2. And it really doesn't change the phase speed a whole lot. It's still in the ballpark of 5 meter per second for the MJO. Um, and just a, a different view of the exact same data. If we looked at the frequency instead of phase speed, um, we see that the frequency is roughly a constant as a function of wave number, which is that peculiar dispersion relation that we saw earlier on. Um, and furthermore, you can show that this fre MJO frequency is related to these model parameters, the, the gamma from the convective parameterization, um, the radiative cooling rates, and this is a, a non-dimensional buoyancy frequency. And, and uh, Q tilde is that vertical gradient of the moisture. Um, so we have a nice, clean relationship to understand how the parameters affect the MJO frequency. Um, and I guess the, the last important piece here is, uh, well, the, you know, as I said earlier, we're showing eastward propagating modes here and westward propagating modes. But the MJO is only supposed to be an eastward propagating phenomena. Um, and that is sort of borne out from this picture right here. This is one piece of evidence that this model will have eastward propagating interseasonal modes. Whereas if you look on interseasonal time scales, you see that there are no westward propagating modes. The westward propagating modes are down here on seasonal time scales. So this is a first piece of evidence that this model captures the asymmetry between eastward and westward propagating interseasonal variability. Um, OK, so that was, that, that was um, a suggestion that the propagation characteristics of this model look like the MJO. And then the next question is, what about the structure? Does, this, does the physical structure of the circulation and everything like that, does that look like the MJO? Um, and so here we show low-level pressure contours. Um, the colors correspond to convective heating. So the red is, is enhanced convection heating, and the, the blue is, is suppressed convection. And what we see are quadrupole vortices here. This is the, the lower-level winds, so it's, they're flipped from what I had shown in observations earlier. And we see this quadrupole vortex structure um, that follows along. Um, along with the convective activity. And this is this structure is sort of a, a combination of a, of a Kelvin wave structure and an equatorial Rossby wave structure. OK, so those were the linear waves. They, they give a suggestion that, that this, this model's modes look like the actual MJO in terms of its planetary features. Um, now, I guess the next question is, what if we run nonlinear simulations? How, how, do these, um, how does this model 
evolve in time. And so what we'll do first is just try the simplest setup. We'll just use a constant sea surface temperature. Okay. And we now see dynamics that look like this. So I guess the, um, we see this, this MJO event. This is 40,000 kilometers around the equator and running it for about a year. Um, and we have an M, a single MJO that just keeps actually, I guess, two at any time, propagating around the globe over and over again. Um, and this is the convective heating here. Um, and I guess the, the new feature that arises from the nonlinearity now is an asymmetry. You'll see that the, the red region here is quite narrow. So the convective region is narrow compared to a wider suppressed convective region here, which is also consistent with, with uh, typical MJO events, that the, the, the circulation of the MJO um, tends to occur on a, a broader spatial scale than the convective activity. Um, and this is another picture of that. If we look at the, the zonal and vertical structure, X and Z, you can see that the narrow convective region with upward vertical motion and the, the wider suppressed convective region. Um, and the nonlinear model also has the quadrupole vortices, and now they're, they're stretched in um, in this nonlinear version of the model. OK, and now just one more test with this nonlinear model. We want to see um, what if we included a more realistic, still quite idealized, but more realistic sea surface temperature, where we now include a warm pool and a cold pool to represent the, the Western Pacific sector and the Eastern Pacific. OK. and so. This is a, a time series of the convective activity in this case. And what we see, um, the Manjulian oscillation aligns itself over the warm pool. Um, we, and in this, this case, now we see some irregular fluctuations in the events. It's not quite so regular as in the previous case. Um, and what we also see is that this, there's eastward propagation still dominating here, MJO event after MJO event. OK, so those are hopefully uh, a good suggestion at the, at the realistic behavior of the Mann-Julian oscillation in this model. And I guess um, the question remains, we didn't talk a whole lot about you know, what are the mechanisms at work here. Um, so let's go back to the equations, which um, we didn't take a, too much of a look at earlier. Um, so I've been saying that this is a, a nonlinear oscillator model, and I just want to point this out really explicitly. Um, so if we have highlighted in red, the Q and the A terms, and I've split up that nonlinear term into a, a linear piece and, a, and the nonlinear piece. Um, and in this form, you can now really see this oscillator equation. It's, it's your typical harmonic oscillator you know, that, that you see for a spring or a pendulum or whatever, where QT is minus A and AT is Q. Um, so at the heart of this is a a moisture convection oscillation, but it's quite a bit more complicated than that because, I mean, there's there's this uh, vertical advection term of the, the background moisture here. So obviously, it's not just an oscillation. It's interacting with the fluid dynamics. And you really need the whole model to understand how the MGO is really working. Um, and also, there, it's, it's a nonlinear oscillator, not just a linear oscillator. Um, but I guess. It's a quick summary. This model is a it's a moisture convection oscillator model, but it's really moisture convection and fluid dynamics oscillator model. Um, OK, and I just wanted to point out um, some more of the details of the actual model that I was using in those results earlier. So I was not showing three-dimensional results. We were, um, what we actually do is we're going to go from this 3D model and we're going to do a vertical truncation. So we, we only keep that first periclinic mode. And so from there, we arrive at a, shallow, a system of shallow water equations with our convective parameterization. Um, and this is similar, if you're familiar with the Matsuno-Gill model, this is similar to that, except here, like I've said earlier, we don't have any dissipative mechanisms. There's no damping here. Our, our assumption is that. Um, there's no damping or instability on the planetary scales. And that the damping and instabilities really are occurring on smaller scales, like synoptic scales and mesoscales. Um, and 
from this set of equations, it's, um, this is maybe the easiest place to see the conserved energy of this model. So there's no damping. There's no, um, and so this model has a conserved energy, which is written out down here. Um, and the first two terms there are plenty familiar. There's a, a kinetic energy term, u squared, a dry potential energy term, theta squared. And then there's these two new terms, which I've put in color. Um, so the blue one there is sort of a moist potential energy term involving both theta and q. And this last term here is a little peculiar. Um, but what it actually says is that part of an en this energy involves the convective activity A itself. Um, um, and we, we, uh, we are currently working on trying to understand what exactly that means, that the convective activity um, has a, a contribution to the energy itself. But I guess w maybe one quick way to think about it is just that uh, this convective activity represents um, smaller scale fluctuations. It's the envelope of that convective activity. Um, and so it, it really perhaps represents smaller scale fluctuations, and so it really represents energy on smaller scales in some sense. Okay. Um, and then one more step from here to get the actual model that I was showing you results from. Um, so if we now take not just this vertical truncation here, but if we take a meridional truncation as well. So now we're using meridional basis functions that look like Gaussians, or perhaps um, this K represents a Kelvin wave structure, um, and, and there's other possible meridional structures that can be used. We arrive at this model right here. And this is a one-dimensional model now. So the only we've gotten rid of Z and Y, and we have only X left. Um, and so we just took our 3D model down to 1D. And so one of the nice advantages of this model is that it's really computationally cheap. So it takes seconds or minutes to run this model to, to simulate you know, years of time. OK, so just to get our bearings again, um, so I've hopefully convinced you that uh, the linear modes and the nonlinear evolution of this model capture the, the basic features of the observed MJO. Um, now I want to present yet a third version of this model, a stochastic version. Um, so this is in a paper that's in press right now in Jazz um, with uh, Andy Maida from NYU and a postdoc at NYU named Sulian Thule. Um, and so the, the basic idea now in this paper is going to be let's replace this convective activity equation with a stochastic jump process for the growth in decay of A, rather than an ODE, rather than the simple differential equation. Um, and so this, in this stochastic jump process, it's going to be consistent with this equation in the sense that it satisfies that equation in the mean. Um, and so I guess why introduce this stochastic process instead of the ODE? Um, I guess the intuition there is that what we're really trying to represent is the growth and decay of convective activity on smaller scales, which is it's really stochastic. Because there, in this model, we're not resolving any of the details of the synoptic and mesoscale fluctuations. So the growth and decay of that convective activity should, should be stochastic. Um, and another aspect of the, the motivation for a the stochastic model is what we really want to capture is, is intermittent generation of MJO events. And so um, I pointed this out on a really early slide, but this is just another picture of it. So this is a, a recent field experiment um, called Dynamo and, and Cindy from 2011 to 2012. And you can see over the, this is the, the Western Pacific region here for, let's see, I guess about uh, nine months, eight months or so. And what you see is there's not a lot of MJO activity in September, but then there's a sequence of one, two, and maybe a third MJO event, followed by a quiet time. So this, this type of picture it differs from what the model showed earlier on. So if we go back 
to this nonlinear model results. I mean, in this nonlinear model, it's interesting that there's there's some irregular fluctuations in each of these MJO events over a time period of uh, let's see, that's about 800 days, so a few years. But what you don't what you see here is it's just MJO event after MJO event after MJO event. So part of the motivation for a stochastic parameterization of convective activity is we want to capture the intermittent generation of MGO events. We want to see MGO events, maybe a sequence of a few, but then we want to see quiet times as well. So this is we want to see the growth and demise of wave trains, of clusters of MGOs. OK, so now with this stochastic parameterization, um, the model results now look like this. So um, these first four are raw data from the model. So this is the zonal velocity at the equator and the potential temperature, um, the, the moisture, and the convective activity. And this is each plot shows all the way around the globe, 40,000 kilometers. And let's see, this looks like uh, about a thousand days, so a few years of data. Um, and this red line going down the center of each one, that's just showing where the, the peak of the warm pool is, as it was before. Um, and now what you see is much more variability in these MJO events. And um, I think the MJO signal is probably clearest in the zone of velocity. So up here towards the top, you can see a sequence of one, one, two, three, four, maybe five in a row. Um, then there's also plenty of quiet times where there's not much MJO signal, like down around here around 3,500 days, um, and maybe down around 2,800 days as well. Um, and so to, to help identify these MJO events a little more clearly on this right panel here, is showing a projection onto the MJO mode. Um, so you can see how, like for instance here, there's a quiet time around 2,900 days. And then you see the generation of a strong MJO, a second one, and maybe a weak third one before the wave train dies away. Um, and you can, you can sort of make these out these events out to the eye and the convective activity as well, but um, since the convective activity is uh, quite stochastic. It's it's a little difficult at times. Um, but yeah, I guess the main point here is that uh, by adding a stochastic parameterization for this convective activity envelope, we, we are now seeing the intermittent generation of MGO events and the organization of MGO events into, into wave trains, like right here at this time. Um, so even more um, realistic features are now appearing. Um, and this plot now shows the, the spectral power of each of those four variables from before. Um, so one feature of the MJO that, that we had pointed out earlier is that, um, that, that people, people have seen right from the initial studies of the MJO is that the MJO is eastward propagating. So one question is, if, we, if we're looking at this space-time variability, are, um, are we seeing more eastward variability than westward variability? And yes, that is the case here as well in this model. The eastward power is larger than the westward power. Um, so if we look in, in this band of the MJO compared to the, the westward band here, you see there's quite a bit more power in, in the eastward band. Um, and similarly, down in the lower right for the convective activity, there's a lot more eastward convective activity than westward convective activity if you're looking on the planetary interseasonal scale. Okay. Um, okay. So I guess this brings us now to this the last piece um, on the MJO's muscle. So we've been talking so far about the skeleton of the MJO which we're calling its planetary and interseasonal features. Um, but not all MJO events look the same. Um, lots of MJO events have additional details beyond what we've been calling the skeleton here. Um, so we're going to refer to those details as the MJO's muscle, 
which is, is different from every MJO event to every other MJO event. Um, and um, part of the other reason for calling it the MJO's muscle is that one common example would be some enhanced circulation strength, like a westerly wind burst, which sort of provides a little extra muscle to the winds of the MJO. Um, and so one example of this, one really prominent example, was a westerly wind burst during Toga Corps. This was a, a field experiment over the Western Pacific back in 1992, 1993. Um, and this is showing the the zonal wind over a period of a couple of months and showing the vertical structure of this horizontal wind. And what you see in late December, early January is the, see, so the, the stipple, the shading is, is positive zonal wind, so that's the westerly winds. And you see westerly winds forming initially near the surface. And then the maximum um, rises up from the surface and into the lower troposphere and reaches a really strong maximum here of, uh, let's see, 4, 8, about 16, somewhere around 16 to 18 meter per second. Really strong westerly wind bursts. And this, this type of strong wind is not represented by the MJO skeleton model that I had, had been showing in the earlier parts of this talk. Um, so this muscle here is coming from something else. Um, and Moncrief and Klinker, they identified a potential source of this extra strength in the westerly wind burst as being convective momentum transport due to some synoptic or mesoscale convection. Um, and then some further theory by Mina and Biello um, also took a look at this to, to try to show that convective momentum transport can contribute to this enhanced westerly wind strength. So I just wanted to show a few more, one, just a couple slides on, on further development of, of those ideas. Um, so in, in this type of thinking, the, the idea was to, was to ask the question, if we had a convectionally coupled wave, could its momentum transport accelerate the winds as seen here? And they found that the answer was yes. Um, but one thing that that type of, that type of uh, formulation ignores is what about the interaction in the other direction. How does the mean wind affect the waves? Um, so one thing that we've looked at in a couple of subsequent papers is a two-way interaction model where we have convectively coupled wave mean flow interaction. So the, the, convect the convection can drive the mean flow, and also the mean flow can affect the convection. Um, so just to give one quick slide on some of the results of that work. Um, yet this is another indication of westerly wind burst intensification due to convective momentum transport from convectively coupled waves. And uh, so what we see in this slide is this is a, a small domain of 6,000 kilometers. And there's one convectively coupled wave. You can think of this as a convectively coupled Kelvin wave which was seen at the same time as, uh, um, uh, as that westerly wind burst in the, the Toga Core MJO. Um, and so it's from about 1050 to 1060. Um, if we look over here at how the mean wind evolves, what you see is, let's see, from the dashed to the thick dashed, you see this is, a, this is the zonal wind as a function of height, and we see a the westerly wind maximum goes from the surface and rises up into the lower troposphere. So there's a strong enhancement of the lower tropospheric westerlies. And this is coming from, from what I showed in the earlier slide, coming from the momentum transport driving a change in the mean wind. So we have upscale energy transport from the synoptic scale waves to this um, planetary scale um, westerly wind. Um, and this model is interesting in that it, 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 can, it can model all, both interactions between the mean wind and the waves, which you see in the later development of, of the wave here, but I won't go into any more of those details. Um, but what we found if, from playing around with this model is that the interactions between the convectively coupled waves and the mean flow, you'll see energy transports that are upscale, as in 
this case right here, where small-scale convection drives a westerly wind burst to be stronger than it perhaps would have been. Um, but other cases we've considered also show instances where the energy transport is downscale. And in those cases, the, the convection acts sort of like cumulus friction in the sense that it, uh, it uh, extracts energy from the large scales. And that, that was actually my last slide. So this, this went quite a bit faster than I thought it would, but I guess because uh, no interruptions, we'll, we'll do that to a, to a talk. But um, just to summarize um, what we went through here, um, the main part of the talk was on this minimal nonlinear oscillator model for the MJO skeleton. Um, and what I showed was evidence that this model simultaneously predicts mm -hmm. fundamental features of the MJO, at least its fundamental features on intraseasonal and planetary scales, um, including slow eastward phase speed, this peculiar dispersion relation, and uh, quadruple vortices. Um, and then we saw in the nonlinear version of the model, we saw asymmetries appearing with a stronger, narrower region of enhanced convection. And then the third version of the model was a stochastic version, where we now are seeing quite a bit of other interesting variability where you can have intermittent generation of MJO events and clusters, wave trains of MJO events that grow in demise or, or with growth in demise. Um, and then lastly, as the counterpart to the MJO skeleton, I just wanted to briefly mention the MJO's muscle, um, which, which uh, we're calling the further details of beyond the MJO skeleton with one example being, for instance, a westerly wind burst. And uh, um, it showed a little bit about how convective momentum transport can play a role there through convectively coupled wave mean flow interactions. Um, so that was it. Uh, thanks a lot. Well, thank you, uh, Sam. And uh, I have just a, a question. Um, sure. I know recently, um, you know, you, you look out in the Western Pacific or you go out in the Indian Ocean and, and you know, when you're, you're trying to see where the MJO is many times. Um, you know, recently, for example, it just seems to, we can't quite find it sometimes, I guess. And, yeah. and does that, is that just something that's just because of the way the Kelvin waves or Rossby waves are interacting with the MJO particularly? Or, or what, what's your thought about that? Because it just seems like it hasn't been able to really get together and move east recently. Or do we just have these times where you just don't see the MJOs really forming yeah, I, and moving? I, I think it's your last point. I think that, uh, you know, the, the MJO, sometimes it's around and it's really strong. But other times, you, you know, you just don't see it. Um, and I guess this, that could be from, for a number of reasons. Um, one, one reason is, is kind of like you were saying, it, it, it could be interacting with tropical features, like convectively coupled Kelvin waves or convectively coupled Rossby waves, which I, we're perhaps seeing here. Maybe there's a convectively coupled Rossby wave coming in during Cindy. Um, I, I would have to look at the filtered data to, to, to verify that that truly is a convectionally coupled Rossby wave. Um, or it could be extratropical interactions as well. There are, are lots of instances where um, extratropical Rossby waves could come in and, um, and, and dry out the tropical troposphere and, and, uh, and create the demise of an MJO event. Um, or vice versa, the trop an extratropical Rossby wave could, uh, could come in and, and play a role in MJO initiation. Um, and, and these are really, really hot topics at the moment that people are trying to understand better, um, trying to understand MJO initiation, MJO shutdown, um, and, and interactions with extra tropics and things like that. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, and uh, uh, hopefully, hopefully uh, we'll have a better understanding of that soon. Well, thank you, both of you. This is Bill Ward. I, I play with the Western Pacific. I'm out here at the Pacific Region headquarters, and I've worked all over the Pacific. And I, I, to that point, I, I have some questions, too. Um, you, you certainly, I, I like the part where you went into talking about the muscle as to how some of the convective activity happens and all that. But, I mean, some of the things that I deal with and struggle with out here is 
you know, you'd look at our soundings and it's, you almost have to ask yourself, why isn't there thunderstorms happening out here? Uh -huh. I mean, they're always moist, they're always unstable, and you certainly have an inversion. <clears throat> but, and to that extent, you know, I, not too long ago, I, I learned about uh, GPS MET sensors. And to that extent, I now have them scattered about the Pacific. And I, I want to offer that kind of information up, too, because now we're trying to find ways to not only look at westerly wind bursts, Kelvin waves, Rossby waves, and MJO and all that, but also how does the atmospheric rivers and stuff get transported up out of the deep um, tropics, and how does this all interrelate? Because it seems like there's an awful lot of talk of MJO, convective activity, and, and things, you know, how they relate climatologically and, you know, even as you stated, you know, you can kind of see how these, you know, manage to maintain their, um, oh, I'm not sure, um, maintain their, their being all the way around the globe. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess where I'm trying to go here is I, I'm trying to understand a little bit more of the chicken and the egg on some of this moisture, some of this convective activity, and how the, the relationship of M, an MJO or atmospheric river or even one of the things you just mentioned there, an extra tropical low or something, you know, even north of the area pulling that moisture. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, <laughs> those are those are definitely lo lots of things that I'd like to understand better too. Um, I, I guess uh, so. One thing you mentioned was was MJOs possibly circumnavigating the globe and going all the way around it, and maybe triggering a new event. And uh, th those are other interesting cases that, that I'd like to know more about because um, you, you typically don't see that when they reach the, the eastern Pacific in these cold SSTs, they tend to die out. Um, or you don't uh, see them continuing or, or, on. Perhaps yes, or you, perhaps you don't see the signal of it in the in the convection or in the precip, but you do perhaps still have a a dynamical signal in the winds and the pressure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I I'd be interested in in learning more about. You said you have um, you set up GPS map sensors that I've set up out there. I'm working cool. very closely with OAR right now, and um, <laughs> you know to that extent it, it's kind of funny. I mean. We have probably far more tropical cyclones than any other basin in the Western Pacific, with the exception of from about 2004 up until 2013. I mean, finally, things are starting to heat up a little bit. But it's kind of interesting to me when I got to looking at how some of these tropical cyclones were um, coming across where these I have these GPS, uh, GPS MET sensors. I would have almost expected an immediate ramp up of moisture and even somewhat of a ramp down of moisture after the uh, cyclone had passed, but that wasn't at all what happened. Really, it was actually interesting in how that you know yeah of course the moisture ramped up as the tropical cyclone went across, but you get this spike um, hours to maybe even days depending on how fast the tropical cyclone is going afterwards, to where you suddenly see moisture pop up, and then if you get to looking at like some of the data the TPW um, data that's coming out of uh, CIRA, their satellite imagery and stuff. It's really interesting in how you see, um, you know, when that ramp up occurs, you also start seeing moisture getting pulled up there. And I, I, sometimes I think it's part of the uh, feed, or I hate to use that word, but for lack of understanding a, a better way of saying that, but the moisture transport up into the tropical cyclone or up into the extra tropical um, of it as it's moving out. So there are some other interactions that's going on here, so I guess is my point, that sometimes I, I wonder if we're confusing a little bit of apples and oranges as to MJO and what may be happening after some uh, synoptic feature passes. Okay. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, so, yeah you bring up a, a number of good points. Um, yeah, one thing about all the results I showed is that there's, there's not really any extra tropical interaction in these models at all, so it's, it's all built on hypotheses about What's tropical and uh, and uh, um, and what could be explained by tropical phenomena only? And one thing we'd like to um, investigate more, and we're we're starting to look into this, is interactions with the extratropics, um, perhaps atmospheric rivers or extratropical Rossby waves. Um, um, yeah, and and also um, your point about just just identifying the MGO and what a challenge that is. Um, and so we're we're also trying to look into 
into data analysis, further data analysis methods. There are already some good, there are already good methods out there. Um, <coughs> excuse me, but but um, but there's also still plenty of challenges as well in terms of um, identifying where the MJO is um, at any particular time, um, and 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 arguing about what is an MJO and what isn't, as, as in some of these cases in the Dynamo Field campaign. Um, okay. Well, I, I don't want to dominate the call, but I will throw one more thing out there. I mean, if you would like to work with me a little more on some of this so that, you know, some of the moisture stuff that I'm working with, too, um, you can reach me, reach me at bill.ward at noaa.gov, and I'd be more than happy to share what we're doing out here and also where I have the sensors and, and what we're already learning from them. Cool. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, yeah, I'll have to send you an email. Sure. I had a question, uh, just one question <clears throat> about the uh, Wesley Windburst. Uh -huh. uh, I, I started working with uh, Dr. Thomas Weichmann about 14 years ago, and he introduced me to the oh, NGO, and so I've been watching it for quite some time now. But I've never heard of the Wesley Windburst, and that, that really I think, has me fascinated. Uh, does, this, does the burst itself, is that a product of the, the MGO event wave train, or does that incite the wave train? Um. I would say it, it can be a product of the MJO wave train. Um, not all MJOs have strong westerly wind bursts associated with them. Um, and I should also point out that westerly wind bursts can also occur in the absence of MJOs. Um, but I guess one one interesting feature of, of some MJOs is that they they are accompanied by strong westerly wind bursts. Um, and I guess just just a, a little extra piece of, of information that which maybe you're, you're already familiar with is that one one interesting aspect of westerly wind bursts is that they can uh, um, they can excite oceanic Kelvin waves which can then interact with, for instance, El Nino, things like that. So the westerly wind burst um, um, can potentially be important for for different teleconnections in different ways. Now we can also have are there such things as easterly wind bursts? Obviously, we've seen MJOs kind of propagate westward into eastern Africa. Is there an, an easterly wind belt, a burst, that would be associated I, with those features? I have not heard the term easterly wind burst, but I guess that doesn't okay. mean it, it doesn't exist. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> yeah. Very good presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Do we have any other questions for Sam? Okay, very good. Well, Sam, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, this is fascinating work you're doing here, trying to unravel the mystery of the MJO, even now, all these years after it was first discovered. Yeah, yeah and thank you, John. Thanks for the invitation. This was fun. Well, you're most yeah, welcome. And thank you, everybody, for joining us uh, today, and we hope to see you next time on our next uh, Central Region uh, Science Sharing webinar. Bye-bye. And, John, this will be posted to the web again, right? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you.